Well, I just probably need to introduce myself. Thanks very much for those kind words. Um, obviously, I've been in IT for about 20 years now. Uh, the organisation started in Brimwood, a little computer shop back in uh, 2003, and uh, running around doing a bit of networking. But uh, in the last few years, as the organisation has grown across the state, we have seen a lot of scams and a lot of issues in the uh, top security area. So I started doing these talks probably about three years ago. Um, it really took off during COVID, and as you're all aware, we're working a little bit differently these days. We're starting to work, and I'll show you a statistic today, but I think it's about 50% of the time we work away from the office, about half this work away from the office, 50% of the time. So that changed the landscape a lot, and um, what I've been preaching for quite a while about these scams and about issues with, um, with IT systems and platforms and, uh, and, and, and security breaches, people are starting to listen to it, which is fantastic. So. Um, I am from a small town, we've been there 20 years, as I said, but um, it doesn't mean we don't do business in the, in the larger areas like in Perth. Uh, we have quite a few clients in here and office down here, so we can mix it. But we also know that the regions are scammed and targeted a lot, so very trusted <coughs> people in the country, and um, unfortunately end up uh, losing quite a bit of money and also quite a bit of data. So today what I'll do, I'll show you a little, a little bit about some of that, just give you the education that you possibly need at a really low level. I'm trying to connect the high end I guess the, the real technical stuff with um, the social engineering side of it, where people are targeted um, and leaned on and tricked, and that's really what comes out. Um, doing the research with passwords, when you're reverse engineering um, a lot of the cybersecurity attacks where a, a breach or a hack has happened. So, uh, for example, LinkedIn 2012 was breached, um, the data was released online in about 2016, Dropbox, they were hit hard, all the information's released. <coughs> When these organisations are, are breached, it's not just your name, your phone number, your address, all that sort of stuff that's leaked. It's also your passwords. So especially going back a few years ago, so there was no encryption on passwords, so they weren't hiding them. They are now, but sometimes they can get past that too. So you need to understand that when you're giving your information to someone, um, you're trusting them with that. When you sign up to an app, a website, if you go to a local doctor's surgery, your dentist, when you're giving that information over to them, if they are breached, that information is then shared online. Um, reverse engineering of those passwords, we can see the patterns, we can see how they work. We know that most of you are going to probably use your child's name in your password, or if you don't have children, or you like your pets better, maybe you've got your pet's name in your password. You're generally going to use a number that's really, you know, well, actually the football teams are quite popular too, so for whatever reason, Fremantle and Docker supporters seem to always have Fremantle or Freo in them. Passwords. Um, numbers are really important to your people, obviously. So when you're uh, your year of birth, for example, your children's year of birth, your, your, it might be your, um, your house number. Um, these numbers are what are generally in there. Capital letter, we know that's the first one. It's rare, you don't put capital anywhere else. Um, so we can see that by going back and reverse engineering those breaches. 99% of people use a, a password that they've worked out, something to do with their lives like that. It's not random and they regularly use the same passwords for everything else. So just be aware of that. If you've used passwords in the past, don't use them again, because if a breach has happened, if you use a LinkedIn password from a few years ago, chances are it's sitting out there on the, online for someone to find, and they can get into your email if you're still using that. They can have a go at your internet banking. They can jump into your Facebook and social engineering, you something along those lines. So yeah. passwords, one of the things we want to talk about this morning. Multi-factor authentication, really important. Passwords are sort of, I guess, 15 years ago, how we did our security. Two-factor or multi-factor, and I'll break that down a little further today, um, is, is the key to stopping it. 99.9% .9 of breaches will be stopped if we've got two-factor authentication across all of our apps, all of our emails, everything we currently use. Really important. And um, the third thing, that, and I'll probably just brush on this today because I think we're out of time, but compliance. There's a massive change in compliance for data. So data is what you're working on. So we've always known that we're going to be audited if we don't get our financials correct, if we're not doing that, not going down the right path with our financials. In the future, in the next few years, watch the government come down on the data, the compliance. You'll be asked to be compliant in the area of data, not leaking the data out of your organisation to other countries. It doesn't leak into China, into Asia, wherever it's going, to Russia, because at the moment it's happening hand over fist, and we see it on a daily basis with clients. So because we haven't looked at how we house our data, how we look after it, how we're sharing it, and with these changes, especially with COVID, um, we're all having to do it a completely different way. Um, the government's getting very serious about this, and we're seeing it in the uh, employment sector at the moment. 
where the compliance screws are being turned. And you will not get funding, you will not be able to run an organisation if you don't have the compliance to a certain level. It will come to the financial sector soon, if it's not already, and, and we're having to deal with it on a daily basis with our clients. So they're the three things. Sorry, I'm getting serious, and I will scare you a little bit, hopefully, today, but um, please take it lighthearted. And if you've got any questions, feel free to interact with me. Most of the time, my talks are probably 50 people or less, so I do like them to be sort of a little bit more interactive. So any questions, pop your hand up. And if you don't understand something, just pop your hand up. I did a talk the other week, mentioned the cloud quite a few times during the talk, and at the very end, the lady asked me what the cloud was. So the cloud is someone else's server, if you, if you, if you don't know, guys. If you're saving data on uh, Microsoft's cloud or Google's cloud, it's just their servers instead of yours. So. All right, um, and also um, just have a little think about your own organisation today. Um, we see this regularly. Um, putting your password on your keyboard isn't hiding it. Um, sticking it to your screen. Um, there's a balance in where you find your own organisation and your own lives between that compliance and those efficiencies that you're after. Um, and that's what we sort of are living in that world now, trying, trying to work our way between. Frustrations lead to shortcuts and allow scammers and, and hackers. And you know, I won't say hackers too much today because it's pretty rare we deal with hackers. Hackers target large organisations. Scammers target small, um, target small business, and that's what we're talking about today. So we'll start off with um, just showing you work and finding passwords. Obviously, we know just from that video that most people are creating their own passwords and they're regularly using the same password again. Sometimes slightly different, but usually you're sort of using the, your child's name or whatever it might be. There are some common passwords. These would be your top 20 um, in 2020 worldwide. Um, please don't use any of the common ones. No keyboard shortcuts all that sort of stuff. It's really simple. And most password cracking programs are all over that really quickly. There's also these websites. I call these ones the, uh, the red dot sites, the $2 websites. So basically, this is a search I did probably about two years ago after I went to a cybersecurity conference in Melbourne. It was searching my, that's an old company domain name, we were best computing originally. Um, when I did the search of my email address, within uh, 0.1 of a second, it came up uh, showing my password, which scared me a lot. And I'll show you a site to start to this. This site was taken down by the FBI last year because it was too good. It's pretty impressive. But it cost around about $16 a month to subscribe to this. This particular site only in Bitcoin, but the new site I'll show you today, you can pay with normal credit card. Now these sites house over 10 billion accounts, breaches. And they're on plain, plain to see on the, on the standard internet, not on the dark web, just there. I call them the $2 shop because a lot of it's jumbled up a bit, you know, you might get multiple entries, that sort of stuff, but really easy to get to. You can see there, um, we hadn't had kids at that point, so the cap was my password. I didn't, hadn't capitalised the capital letter yet, but that came about 12 or 18 months later. And um, you now know what year I was born in, because that's what I was using as my uh, numbers on the internet. So I fit into that profile quite nicely. Um, you can see that that particular breach came from LinkedIn in two hands. But I'll just go, I'm going to go live to a site and just show, show you a search. And, and this is something that anyone can do. There's two sites. There's one that um, was created by a Microsoft engineer. Um, his is for good. The other one they claim is for good. So you can go and check your clients uh, if any of their information has been breached. But really, we probably think that's been used for that. So this one's called Dehashed. Um, as you can see, I've put in our old domain name up here, so bestcomputing.com.au. Um, we hit search, and then it brings up a whole range of any breaches that this domain has been involved in. Um, I don't bring up other organisations live, because it can get a bit embarrassing if we see people's passwords. Um, but really, all you've got to do is click on here. You'll see here, um, there's mine. Click on the, uh, and you can see there, that's where that Monty 77 is. So, um, as you can see, my organisation, um, we had a guy, Daniel, that worked for us. You know, obviously his password wasn't very secure. <laughs> one password. Um, this one here, I would, you know, it's, it's just a little keyboard shortcut. Um, so if you, you're using these sort of passwords on multiple sites, if you're doing that for your login at work, to your Facebook, to, you know, obviously if someone gets hold of one of these, they can get into anything. So. And for those that have just jumped on looking, just stay with me, because your passwords have been out there for the last 10 years. So the next 15, 20 minutes won't hurt. <laughs> this particular site, um, this is by uh, a guy called Greg Hunt. He's that Microsoft engineer. So you can type in anything in here and you can search. This is something that you should use. So if you're not sure if, you, if you've been in a breach, you can jump on this one, type it in, and have a look. So I'll just chuck on it. Right, 
So it comes up and it tells you you've been pawned, and there's a lot of acronyms and weird words in IT too. I don't know where a lot of these came from, but um, it's, it's basically saying that your information's been stolen. Um, it's in a, in a few blocks here. So these ones aren't as, aren't as probably as serious. Uh, what they are more is people's information being collected for spamming, etc. Um, this one is Ledger. I'm not sure if anyone's in the crypto space, but um, Ledger had their some details compromised. That was only in 2020. Um, no passwords though. You'll notice it tells you what was stolen. Um, just email addresses, names, phone numbers, physical addresses. But a lot of that information is very important. So get your hundred point ID to get you know set up a fake account somewhere. That goes a long way to doing that. There's the LinkedIn one I was talking about. 164 million accounts, um, all gone, and every password went as well. Um, and then that was scraped again last year. So they didn't get passwords last year, but again, uh, they had a, a bit of a, a fault in the way it was designed, and you could get a lot to scrape and pull information off. So, that, so they, basically, the, the scammers got a whole range of new information last year. Um, that's about all my uh, accounts being in there, but if you pop yours in, you might find Dropbox pops up, Canva. There's all sorts of ones recently that have been, uh, been breached. There's some really big ones. Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. Stunned looks on the faces, that's good. All right, so obviously we know now where people can get our details. So we've got the basic passwords, we've got common, you know, the common passwords. Dark web. Uh, dark web's a different one. Uh, it's not too difficult to get onto the dark web. Um, dark web is just literally another internet that is running sort of side by side. It's not as regulated. Um, I was on the other day doing a bit of research and um, probably within 15 minutes I got through to a site, registered for a forum and then was able to search through and purchase any one of 1.2 million credit cards. Um, I filtered it down to Australia and then I found three in particular from Melbourne and I was able to put them into my basket. I could then um, I needed to transfer money in, which I hadn't done. So, but if I wanted to, I just hit commit purchase. It's like a, it's a little bit like having a wallet in a in a, in a cryptocurrency uh, website where you can you can actually transfer. Anyone that's done that before, it's quite simple. It's really seamless. This was exactly the same. And uh, when you then uh, purchase it, it takes the money out of your wallet, obviously, and your, it reduces your amount you've got there. And then um, and then it has a little cool little tool, which is a checker. And the checker actually checks each credit card to make sure it's still valid, it's still functioning. If one of them comes back with a cross, it allows you to then go and choose another credit card from the list of 1.2 million. So these three were um, Australian ones, like I said, in Victoria. Um, that was $6, $6.80, I think, each. So you can understand it's quite simple to buy that information online. And that information is coming from those breaches. So I guess what I'm trying to show you is that um, in, in, a, in a world where we've had a pandemic, there's a lot of people with not a lot of money and a lot of issues internationally. The temptation to jump across and do and use things like this is huge. And it's so simple to do. We're not talking about high-end IT people. We're not talking about hackers. We're talking about someone that's got 15 minutes, school kids, you name it, can jump onto the dark web, go and search this information, and then, and then start to use it. So we need to start changing the way we're dealing with our data, our systems, to protect ourselves a little bit better. Is there any questions so far? The dark web, how do you access it? Yeah, the dark web, so... <laughs> Um, good yeah, yeah, we'll do a lesson after. But basically, um, it uses a different browser. It's a different, it's a different network. So if you think about, literally, like um, it might be, you know, those that have travelled and you've got a super highway built on top of somewhere, it's a little bit going down the streets underneath. Um, so you're using a different browser and a different network. It's pretty slow and clunky, but it is using the same infrastructure or similar infrastructure worldwide to get around. And it comes back to understanding how the internet was created, and that's really, you know, two computers wanted to talk to each other. They worked out a, a protocol or a, and then they, then they wanted to sort of get the whole office working and then they wanted to connect it to the next building. And that's how it started. Everyone's connected now. And, and utilising the rules that they've created for the dark web, that's how you can flow through there. There's rules for the standard internet, obviously, and that's we all agree on those and that's how we float around there. But the dark web's just slightly different. So the tall browser is traditionally known to, to browse. But anyone can do it, it's very simple. A lot of the breaches recently um, have been through phishing. So these guys target small business, one to 250 employees. So that's probably why we've sent so much, and especially being in the regions, we've just been hammered with it. So that's probably fast forwarded our experience a little bit and our, and our will to try and you know, fix a lot of these issues. Um, you've all seen them, you know, Netflix, Dropbox, you've probably had you know, plenty of those come through. 
But those recognisable brands are lots of, you know, drops your guard a little bit. Please don't trust email. And I'll show you in a minute why, but email is not something you should have built your organisation on. It's not a document management system. It's not really even a very good communication system. It was developed in the 90s instead of you know, sending a, something overseas through the post. It, it's a borderless way of, of sending a bit of information, but there was no security around it. There's no organisation. Um, you shouldn't be using email to run your organisation. And I'll show you in a minute why. Treat an email like you would a Word document. That's probably the that's probably how you should treat it. Um, that, that one's good too, the Zoom one. I've heard that before just before a Zoom meeting, you know, thinking that is the actual link, but um, that's a phishing email that came through for, for one of our one of our um, staff members. So I'll just take you through this, this uh, phishing. Um, phishing PH instead of F. I'm from the Northwest, so it's a bit different. Um, don't trust email. Again, I'll show you in a second why. Email, even your communications now, there's so many other ways to communicate, you know. We, we love the Microsoft products because they're working with the Australian government on a lot of the compliance and working through um, security, etc., to make it simple for an organisation to become compliant. So, um, if you receive an email, you should be treating it like like anything else, like a mail, a piece of mail that comes through the post. Who is it from? Well, they're normally asked this. What's going on there? Why are they contacting me? I know we get hundreds and thousands, but that's why we'd rather use chat programs like. like um, Microsoft Teams or something, because you're not having to scroll through a big pile of emails and go through quickly and not make decisions, not make smart decisions when you click on them. Hover over the hyperlink, where's it taking you? If they're asking you to go somewhere, just hover the mouse there. It'll bring up a little um, a little map of where it's about to take you, and it's, it'll, it'll outline in there what the website is. If it's something weird, you probably don't click on it. If it looks legitimate, you can go and Google it and research it, but be careful on those links, because it takes you outside of your umbrella of security. Who is it? What are they asking? Um, you know, the, the language is critical. We've had some, some really high profile people that have been targeted. I have a look at the DFK website too. You know, it states on there who everybody is, what their role is, um, and then from there you can probably work out who would communicate with who. So it's not hard to spoof an email address or a domain. I can send an email from anyone here in the room to anyone else just from my computer here. It's very simple to do. It takes you five minutes to set it up. So you can't trust who that email's coming from. It's the, and I'm, I'm talking from the exact email address, not from a, a weird looking one. So you can't trust that. So you need to look at other things. You need to look at things like the, the, the language of that person. But if you're being socially engineered, someone's watching you, and someone's learning from you, someone's in Facebook watching how you speak, they'll use your language too. So you be really careful of that stuff. We had the shy president in Broome targeted, and very close to some a big amount of money going missing, but just the way they finished the email um, was something along the lines of yours sincerely, and I'll use his name, Harold Tracy, which if anyone knows him, he would never use that language. He, he's very, uh, he's a chippy originally, so he would never say that. So it triggered something, and that person made a phone call. That phone call is two-factor authentication. That's what that is. So if someone sends you an email asking something, what is two-factor authentication? It can be in an app, it can be in a text message, it can be in a WhatsApp message. It's another way of communicating. It finishes that circle of communication. So if you're ever unsure, work out your own way to do two-factor authentication. It could just be a simple phone call. That's MFA. Very important. So, smishing, vishing, spoofing, all these cool things. Um, so I said before, we can spoof uh, domains. So spoofing a domain is basically mean copying your website and sending an email from your re receptionist to your CEO. Um, simple to do. Um, my guys love it when I ask them to set stuff like this up. They get very excited because they're not normally allowed to do this. But, um, so we do that and we show people how simple it is to do it. Um, you've got to understand that phone numbers can imitate it too, very simply. Um, so I can call anyone here in the room from anyone else. It's simple to do. It can even text people from other people. It's great fun for staring at relationships. <laughs> <laughs> what, I'll, what I'll do now, and obviously text messaging scams, everyone knows about those. You've all had the Harvey Norman, the JB Hi-Fi, probably, you know, post office, those sort of ones. They're very good though and opportunistic, so you'll be careful with those. Um, but I'll do now, I'll just show you quickly how simple it is to mimic someone's phone number. So most businesses have, uh, I'm assuming most businesses have voice over IP or VoIP type setups these days with their, with their business systems. So with that, you can go into the system and you can simply change the number you're calling from. And we do this for good because if you're moving from one office to the next and you're not set up with your phone numbers, 
you can set you up over here and just say when you call out, you're gonna be calling from the, the office number that you've always used. And it's fantastic for those intermittent times when you're sort of between. And then when it all, everyone moves across, we turn it off and we put it back to normal and you are actually calling from that number. But it's very simple to go into that software and change that number. So what I did this morning, I grabbed Steve's number. Um, has anyone got Steve's number in their phone? Yep. If you're willing to give me your number, I'll call you from Steve. And, and you know, obviously, we've seen some, we've seen some, <laughs> we've seen some big scams just recently. And what they're doing is they're using this, and they're using deep fake voice to then talk. So they're calling from that number, and then the voice sounds just like that person. So you have to be really aware that some of this stuff is getting serious. Do, can I get a call? I've got Steve's number. I just need your number so I can call you. So I'm calling someone's number, I don't know who this is. Are they in the room? What's my, what's my password? <laughs> you got me. Alright, and who's calling? Uh, some guy called Bushel. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see how simple that is. And that, that literally before I, we sat down just as we got here and changed that. So you'll have a missed call from, um, from Bushel, obviously. Um, very simple to do. There's a little adding for that. It's about, I think it's about three or four hundred dollars, and you can do text messages to it. So, um, and it's deadly serious. So you can see, in terms of scammers, yeah. Just a quick question. So, if Dalton rang that back as a missed call, would it ring Steve? Or yeah, it ring you? It Steve. Wow. Yeah. So you can see as scammers, and, and when I say scammers, these are teams of people now set up in places like Russia, China, in some of the third world countries, India where they are struggling financially. So they set up these teams of people that come to work and they target, you know, might target a town in Australia, might target an organisation, they might target, uh, you know, some sort of group of people and they try and scam them out of money. Um, and they're paid to do that, so they get a percentage back on that. So, but a lot of them haven't even just, you know, these sort of tools aren't being used as yet, but it's so simple. So we're at the very beginning of this wave of scamming, so we have to become serious about this. Yeah. Well, there was a scam in Broome uh, about 12 months ago where um, the calls were coming from the Broome Police Station. So they'd spoof the, the number from the Broome Police Station and they were calling people, especially in the remote communities, the Indigenous communities. Obviously, if you're in the Indigenous community and you've had dealings with the police before, you've saved your, uh, their phone number in your phone. And you get a call from them, it's you know, a bit of a stressful situation. And then they started, exactly what you're saying, just confirming who you are, you know, what's, uh, is, what's your name, you give your name across. You know, this is, and they were saying something about tax debt, you know, unusual stuff. And then they started asking things like driver's license number, um, you what's your address, you know, all this sort of stuff. So they, they're gathering that 100 point ID as well, and then they try and obviously get some money out of you towards the end there. But if they don't get money out, they've probably stolen a lot of your information anyway by getting your driver's license number, etc. So, so at the moment, that seems where it's at. But I still think we're in amateur hour with this sort of stuff in terms of, you know, who's doing it. Uh, wait till it gets serious. Wait till these people have it, you know, really, really red hot crack at this. So. What are they after? Um, everyone knows how to do a 100 point ID. That's what they're after. So the bottom, the bottom stuff's probably more important. But online it's called, on, on the dark web it's called Fools. Uh, full ID, so if you go on Z. And that's the nickname for it. So if you Google out on the dark web, then you get pushed off to all these sites where you're looking for Fools, 100 points of ID. Normally with a credit card too, so you've got that information. Um, but sometimes some of that information is missing. So you, you, might, you might get a lot of it, but you might be missing, I don't know, a date of birth or an address or there's a secret question about a mother's maiden name or something like that. So I find the best place to find the rest of that stuff is on Facebook or on social media. So most people have a social media account. Most people have a lot of that open. Um, if they're quite diligent and they've closed it off, so it's only their group of friends, they don't realise that their good friend Matt has still used his Monty77 password for his Facebook and someone's sitting in his Facebook watching their account. So I've personally been targeted on a, on a crypto, I was over in uh, Hong Kong in 20, when was that Ben, 2018, um, and uh, a photo was put up online and I'd shut down everything and I was tagging the photo within about three minutes. <coughs> we had an email to our accounts department asking about some of the financials from a spoofed email um, that was supposedly from me. So someone was either, and my Facebook was very locked down. So one of my friends 
accounts with Bruce and someone's watching me through one of my friends' accounts, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, so it's not just what you put on there to your friends or even to the wider public. Um, please don't jump on your, uh, your plane tickets on there and take a photo so I'm leaving town. You know, don't, don't announce you're going on holidays on social media. Um, if you really want to share that information, it was fine in 2010, but it's not now. Um, if you really want to share that information, do it when you get back. You know, maybe put a little bit of information, some photos up and show everyone what you've been doing. Um, because I've seen people's houses that have been robbed when they've done that. You know, I've seen um, accounts broken into. Tony Abbott's um, Qantas Frequent Flyer account was broken into once he posted his information online on a photo one time. So, you know, it gives a lot of information there and you've just got to get through probably a pin code or something like that to get to that next stage. I know Qantas now put two factor on, so that's really good. It's much more difficult to get to it. Um, it's about 20 US dollars to get the whole full on the dark web at the moment. So I was looking the other day. So it's not, not too difficult. So it doesn't mean I can target you specifically, but I can go on there and see whose information has been stolen as there. And then you can drill down into countries and you know, sort of be a bit more specific. So um, that's a problem. A lot of the cases that I'm working on, and, and Steve mentioned before, um, I do a lot of volunteer work for people that have been breached because they don't know where to start or what to do. And it has, there's not really a system yet for that. You sort of go through the Australian Cyber Security Centre and get, get the run around and everyone sort of points at each other. But there's a cyber security incident reported through business or, or financials, uh, financial issue um, every eight minutes. And that's what's reported. So we see most of ours of our clients, they don't even report it. So I can't imagine how much cyber crime is happening at the moment. Um, so for 20 bucks, it's, it's, yeah, and, and the issue I was going to say, that, sorry, the issue is, it's not that um, they get your, your ID, etc. yes, that's fine, but then there's hundreds of other mule accounts or fraudulent accounts set up already, ready to go, sitting with banks, and we've just dealt with the NAB over in Queensland, and multiple accounts, the money went out to instantly, and then that money is then, um, someone rocks up at the ATM down the road, they've got their sunglasses, their mask, and their hoodie on, and they withdraw that cash instantly. So, so the money's jumping straight out of the, uh, out of the banks due to those fraudulent accounts over there because they only need a 100 point ID and it's only about 20 bucks online to go and buy that. So you can see the problem there. It's also some, they've got some pretty good business models too. But this is the small right down the bottom here. Um, I found one, a PayPal account that's for sale for $811. It was guaranteed to have 5,000 pounds in it, plus or minus 200 pounds, and if it didn't, you'd get a 48 hour replacement guarantee. So you can see, you know, the good culture in these organisations that <laughs> sounds like a great place to work, you know. Um, this one's really relevant. I know we've all played this game. I'm assuming everybody has. Um, what's your porn star name? Um, so normally it's your childhood pet, uh, and then the street you grew up on. So I call that oversharing. <laughs> Yesterday, as I signed up for my uh, secret questions for MyGov to show that I've been double vaxxed, you can see what these two questions here are. What is the name of the first street I lived in? And what was the name of my first pet? That's what these things are doing. When they're on Facebook, when they're being shared, they're asking for your secret questions, your information. When you throw that out there, you're giving it away. So please don't play those games. Um, remind, I have to remind my mum regularly to not play this game. Um, because all you're doing is giving your information to others. And that information is really important. And the more, the further we get down the track with, with, um, with the internet, the more of your information is out there. So please protect it a bit more these days. You don't have to fill out every single line of that doctor's surgery when you go and you're filling out that paperwork. You just put in what you want to give them. You know, you don't have to, because if they are using, you know, the local, their, their son who does a bit of, computer work and he's helped them set it all up and the rest of it, you don't know that that's not going to be breached and disappear somewhere online and you, know, you, you end up in that $2 shop online with all your information. So email, I mentioned before, there we go. I want to show you probably the most common scam that we've seen. Um, I haven't seen anyone else show this scam. Um, it took us weeks to reverse engineer this um, and it took a lot of work from not only text but sort of a little bit of real world thinking to work out how they did it. Um, so you know where, you know that people obviously uh, can get your passwords, quite simple. I'm not sure how many people are running two-factor authentication on their email at the moment, but if you're not, chances are you could have someone else sitting there looking at your emails right now, because there's no way of telling. So your email is synced to a main server in the cloud. 
and they sync back to your phone, back to there, back to your computer. You might have a tablet as well, it's doing that. What's to stop someone sitting in Russia that has your password because you've used Monty77 from years ago for your email, and then they're syncing your emails all of a sudden. They're coming down to their account. So they're watching you. The average breach of an email account that we've seen between three and eight months. They sit and they watch, and they learn, and they understand your language, your organisation, where you spend money. If you think about how much communication you do through email, you can glean a lot from a person and their organisation. And then they wait to strike. And the striking bit is relatively simple. I said before, you want to make sure you treat an email like a Word document. I bet you didn't know you can edit an email. It's so simple. It's such a simple thing to do. I'll do it live now. So I won't talk as much here. I'll just sort of jump on and show you. Um, and show you how I think, and, and I've just bought a house down here, and there's an amazing organisation that I'm not going to, I'm not pointing them out directly, um, Realty Assist, jump in the middle, and they help the real estate agents with the transfer of the deposit of the house. So I'll just, this has just happened to us recently, I'll just show you how this could go astray. It's not about Realty Assist and their systems, in, well there's a bit, but it's not about them being um, <coughs> breached or having issues. It's not about the real estate organisation, which is peer in this particular case being breached, I mean they're very secure, but it's just their process and how they're gathering that money that isn't. Because imagine if $10,000 for the deposit of the house, you're about to pay it, but your emails are breached by someone else and they're being synced somewhere else in the world. And the only thing they're sending you to pay that $10,000 is a simple email with a link in it on, on a PDF attachment. You click on the link and you go and pay the money. There is no two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication. So the money goes, it can disappear quite simply. We see it regularly. We see house deposits, payments for pools, vehicles purchases. Um, even when I bought a boat long ago, that could have gone wrong the way they did it. You know, I sent an email with the BSPN account details in the email. Their system is probably quite secure, but yours possibly isn't, especially personally, especially if you're using a big pond email account or an <coughs> IINet or a Westnet, because none of those even have the ability to have two-pack authentication on them. And you probably haven't changed the password for five years. So you don't know who's sitting in your account synchronising it. I'll just show you this slide. If you've got any questions, just jump in. So this is the actual email. You can, you can see here. So these guys uh, jump in the middle. They're doing the payment. Here's my invoice. I'll open that up. We'll probably open on the other screen. Drag it across. All right, so I've changed a bit of these details because I didn't need to know exactly my address. Uh, but you can see here, I've left the links, um, let's stay still for a second, should go to these ones. So you can pay through, um, that's a PayPal one, so it goes through a Realty Assist, um, PayPal is linked into it, or you can do a, um, a BPAY. Alright, so on the scammer, that email's just come in, I'm in Russia, and I've seen that, well, here's my opportunity. So um, I've opened up the PDF. I can quite simply edit the link on the PDF. That's, this is sort of 101. And instead of uh, Realty, I'm just going to make that L of 1. Quite simple. I'll just save a copy of that. Close that. Back to the email. So I've opened the email, still sitting there. We haven't even been probably a minute yet. Uh, in the email, there's a cool little function called edit. So I go to edit the message. Now once I hit edit, it is a Word document. I can change whatever I want, very simply. Not only that, Delete that little attachment. Let's put the one back on with the one in it. So it's taking it to a different place. It's not going to Realty Assist, it's going to Realty Assist with one instead of a, an L. That's pretty quick, isn't it? Pretty simple. Um, I save that because it's just a Word document now. I close that. I right click on that. I mark as unread and I disappear. Now you're just grabbing a coffee, so you've 
haven't noticed that it took me two minutes to change that because it's synchronized back to the cloud down back to your computer and you open it up and you see that you've got an invoice there so you open it that invoice is open you scroll down you think I'm going to use PayPal because everyone knows that PayPal is so secure and it's not in my experience just saying um, we actually lost some money on PayPal a few years ago and um, the bank gave us the money back and so did PayPal so I don't know how they're reconciling their accounts because they didn't work at our end hit click on the link and what do you know what I didn't tell you was that we've set up a, a domain during the week called realtyassist.com.au and it looks a lot like the real one You can tell the difference still pretty well normally when you look at our website. So you can see here Realty Assist, the legitimate site. Realty Assist with the one. Really good job, Jay. It was really good. He scraped that site. How long did that take, mate? Uh, two minutes. About two minutes to scrape the site. Um, so we fire that site up. That's ready to go. Um, if you want to chat, you can chat. Either or either. Everything's basically the same. So you can see that they've been taken to the wrong site. It's very hard to tell the difference. And to be honest, if you're, you know, if you're going through that process, you're probably not going to be too diligent about it because you're trusting the whole thing. Realty Assist are an amazing organisation, but your emails are compromised. So you know, there's the issue. Herein lies the issue. I'll just take you through the next stage. Very aware of time too. I'm just going to try a password in there. Very secure. As you can see. <laughs> and, oh, I've done a capital. Yeah, see, I changed that, so I'm used to putting a capital in there. So I should put an exclamation mark in the end. I log in, and um, Jendo's done a nice little payment process thing there. So, obviously, there might be another step there. So, it might actually, you might have to confirm that in the website, but it's, it's pretty simple to do. Um, so, that's done. Um, the other thing that I want to show you is that um, what also happens, not only do we steal the $10,000, He's got a little thing set up in there. If I hit refresh on this and scroll down, this is, it. This is everyone that's logged into this site and it's capturing that information. So you can see at the bottom here, manager and YT77. So not only do we get the money, we've now got your password and you're logging for PayPal. And you're probably using that password for most of your other stuff. So away you go, the scam kicks off. Yo. How would you have otherwise covered that through that multi-factor authentication in this case? So when you went to the payment, there's some sort of uh, registration you've done, so with Peer Realty, you should be getting a text message or whatever other way, a phone call, could be anything, so that you can confirm that you're dealing with the right people. Does that make sense? It does, but in this case where you've amended that, how would you have prevented that? Like, that seems pretty difficult so, to avoid that. Yeah, so what, clicking on the link? Yeah. Um, what, what we've done with, so for example, um, we've got a solar company, Carafa, what they've done is when they send you, now again, I'm, this system, they might have to look overhauling this completely due to that issue. I, you know, it's, it's something for them to work out their policies and procedures and compliance. But um, what we've done with other clients is, if, and, and again, real estate agents that, that target regularly, one, one employee that we deal with, they have a system where an email goes out and part of the information is there and they're asked to contact by a text message or phone call for the other part of the information to do the transfer. So um, you cannot trust email alone to, to, to transfer big funds, sums of money. We've seen some big ones go awry. Um, it's one of the East Kimberley guy lost 350 grand. You know, like that's, it gets, gets serious quickly. Does that make sense? Does that make any sense, everyone? Mm -hmm. Yes? Just my question, can you tell us a bit about CRM data compliance that we use? The C reports? CRM? Yeah, so you're collecting information of... Yeah. 
it comes down to the individual platform. So we and, and we really drill down into Microsoft a lot, but you can link Microsoft uh, 365 into that. Um, it depends what you're capturing, what information you're taking, but I guess we go back to but looking at uh, the compliance, actually I've probably got some of the legislation in the slides, what you're capturing. So if it's your basic information, at the moment there's nothing that's forcing you to, um, you know, there's what's called the um, essential eight maturity model the government put out. There's eight areas they want you to improve and there's a sliding scale of these maturity levels, so zero to, to three. Um, the government want you to be sort of two and three, and that's where they're turning the screws. So what that, what we would suggest to you if you're dealing in this area, area we'd go through those, uh, that essential like maturity model, we'd work through each one of them, and we'd try and get you up to a certain level of, that, of maturity on that. And that would probably tick off you know, a lot of those things in the background. It, it leads back to that compliance area, and again in Microsoft 365, there's a compliance manager that gives you a percentage score. So, it's you're never going to be 100%, but what we, what we would do with that with that particular case, we'd probably do an audit, have a look at it, gather all the information, then give some recommendations about how we handle that information. Um, who's got access to it, administrative passwords, you know, um, you know, a lot of what I'm about to say, I guess, yeah. So, it is very individual on, on what you're using, um, and we obviously play a little bit in the CRM world. There's, there is CRM, there's a CRM plugin for SharePoint, which we love. Um, because that hooks into your logins for your computers, your email, it's all a single sign up thing. Um, and it's very simple to see who's accessed what, etc. And, and I know that some of the CRM organisations um, have got the, this plugin works that will go into that so you can then drag that information out. Does that make sense? Um, there's some pretty cool scams though. Just remember the two factor is great. Text message isn't the best way to do two factor authentication. Um, it's easy to port a phone number two. So we see this and we do this for organisations. So we can grab your, your mobile number and move it from Telstra to Optus. This is an example of a guy, Ian, who had his, he got an email saying, you've obviously decided to leave us. You've gone to whoever, Optus or whatever. Um, and um, just give us a call if you haven't done that. While um, Molly's on the phone on hold, as he would be with Telstra, um, he's uh, getting emails on his computer. So someone's got the 100 point ID, the 20 bucks online, and they've then ported his phone number across because he walked into a shop somewhere in Australia and, and thought, I'll take this guy's mobile. So then I can get into everything else. They've probably done a bit of social engineering, got a few passwords for, of, of his. And then next thing he knows, he's getting emails saying, your pin number, your Qantas membership's changed, your bank account pin number's changed. Um, and then, congratulations, your JB Hi-Fi vouchers are on the way from your Qantas Freedom Fly Point. So you can see how simple it is once you get that two factor. So it is, um, it's not the holy grail, but it's going to stop the majority of things. But if you are targeted, you've got to be, you've got to be ready. And, and CEOs, you know, sort of people that are in the public spotlight really need to understand this. And they're normally the worst, unfortunately, the ones that we deal with. They're the ones, oh, that doesn't apply to me, you know, I'll be right. But they're using their, you know, their kid's name as their password or their, you know, something like 75% of people will use the own, their own organisation's name in their password and then throw a number after it, maybe, you know, the year that they joined. Best 2017, something like that. So yeah, I can see a couple of giggles around. There. It's increasing. It's getting worse. It's uh, we're getting so many more calls. We're having to deal with this, and, and as I volunteer my time, we get I drag into more of these situations. So it's 1.6 times higher than the previous year with business email compromise. So I'm going every eight minutes. They're the ones reported. I reckon there would be nearly ten times that happening. You know, most of us don't tell each other when they've been breached. We've lost money. We've done something silly like that. Keep it pretty quiet. Um, the crazy thing was in Australia that the average loss per successful event was 50 grand. And that's massive, absolutely massive. We struggle to get people to buy some licensing sometimes at you know, a few bucks a month. So yeah, um, uh, some stats there. Probably the big one is the 33 billion as well was stolen. So that's pretty crazy. Everything's up, 13% increase, 67% of, uh, sorry, it's 13% increase in cybercrime reports. Um, it's a pretty good return, 30% for the year, for those in the financial sector, I like that. And who do we tell, what do we do? Well, look, there's the notifiable data breach scheme, but it's a damn if you do, damn if you don't. If you're not set up correctly, and you tell them that you've lost everyone's data, you get big fines. So, do you tell them or don't you tell them? Um, but if you get your data stolen, you get a big fine, too. and they find out, you get a big fine. So, it's a bit of a tricky one. Um, there is a lot of class actions starting to come out now too, so organisations that lose data, uh, 
people are getting together and saying this isn't right and trying to get um, some compensation for that as you, could, as you would expect. And that's an ongoing battle, that one. Um, I'll quickly give you some password statistics too. Um, there's basically only 250,000 words in the English language, so if you're just using a word, a very simple crack. Our cracking programs that we play around with, one of my guys loves a, a, a brute force attack password cracking program, which means he just keeps trying passwords on like a Wi-Fi, for example, and uh, he can do over a million a second. So there's only 250,000 words in the English language. If your password is just, you know, phrases here at Wi-Fi, you're going to be in less than a second. It's so simple. And then you're in the Wi-Fi and away you go. He uses it just to have internet in his block of apartments. He's not here today. I'm looking over there because my guys are smirking. But um, he hasn't paid for internet for about seven years. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, um, this is a lot of values. I am coming with some good news, I promise. Uh, the average business keeps track of about 191 passwords. So just bear in mind, this, this is how the password cracking stuff works, and this is, this is um, really important when you're creating your passwords. Obviously, if you've got two-factor authentication, it doesn't matter. It don't, doesn't, they can go for it as many times as they want, they're not going to get through. But if you have a look here, um, if you create a password that's, let's say it's got five characters, and it's got uppercase, lowercase, mixed letters, well, that's going to take less than five seconds for that program to get in. Okay? Um, he got locked out of his neighbour's Wi-Fi a few months back and uh, he came in whinging about it at work and then we were asking over the next few days how's he going, is he, is he, I think he, I don't know if he's targeting them or someone else in the, in the complex, he was in the complex. Anyway, around about nine days later, so see 10 days here, he came with a smiling face and he's got internet back at home. Um, so we thought he's probably... He's probably, they've probably got a password that's got numbers, uppercase and lowercase letters, and about eight characters long, because that's, that's about the time frame. You can see it blows out. You know, if you're using all of them, and you've got 10 characters, 928 years, you're gonna give up. So the length of your password, if you haven't got two-factor authentication, is really important. This is really, really, I think, specific to Wi-Fi, because most, most organizations throw Wi-Fi in, and then they just, whatever the password that it came with, or they throw something simple on there, your, local, your phone number of the organisation, or whatever it is. Um, it's really easy to just continue to hit the Wi-Fi. It doesn't block you out after three attempts, and a lot of websites still don't do that, so that's the passwords. Um, I've mentioned a lot of it already. Password managers are the answer at the moment. Um, I use LastPass. You know, we've got organisations that do. You can share passwords between you. You don't have to show the other person the password. It remembers your passwords when you go to that website or that app. It puts it in for you. I don't know any of my passwords anymore. Um, it does it. I've got one long password to get into that password app and then two-factor authentication on that. So really simple to use. It saves me probably 15, 20 minutes a day just because I don't have to look up a spreadsheet or open a book in my top drawer or put my passwords in to log into something. So it's not just secure, it's efficient. Um, there's plenty of those out there. They're really cheap. Have a look at those. Um, well, let us know if you need some more information. You can see there, that's what it does. It generates the password for you. And, and people look at those and go, oh, I don't want to know that. I wouldn't remember it. You don't need to. The app does it for you. You can get to it anywhere on your phone, on your computer, anyone's computer, if you've got your own password to get into that app. Two-factor authentication, MFA. We all understand what that is now. It's just communicating on another level. That's all it is. Yes? Yeah, so again, that's why, so do you mean in terms of your whole organisation being hacked? No, the last app. Yeah, so... The last it, yeah. Last okay, so again, we put two-factor authentication on it, so you need a text message or you use an app uh, to, to get in like a Google Authenticator. Um, so very difficult. Um, and if the organisation or the app is actually breached, it's, it's, it's um, encrypted. So they, even, even the company don't know your passwords. If you lose your main password, as we've been through, um, you, you can't get your other passwords back. So it's a pretty secure setup. If someone was really good, they hacked your phone, they got past the two-factor authentication, and they knew your password and got it, yeah, sure, they've got the keys to the kingdom. But like I said before, just having two-factor stops 99.9%. And, and probably, I mean, we're going down a bit of a rabbit hole when we get to that point. Just, just the fact that using a password manager and using two-factor authentication will take out the majority of those issues. VPN use. Yeah. VPN use is fantastic. Yeah, all that's doing though is hiding where you're connecting the internet from. So um, it's about you know, stopping people trace you, come back. So if, if when you're um, when you browse the dark web using a Tor browser, that normally pops you out somewhere else, like I pop out of Germany for whatever reason. Um, it shows you coming out there. That's what a VPN is doing. So when you're using a VPN overseas, you're dialing back in Australia, hopefully, to come out. 
and it puts a tunnel on your information, like, a, like you're in a pipe. So there's no one can inter in intercept that information. Um, please don't use public Wi-Fi for doing anything sensitive either too. So we all, we've all heard stories that we've got a defendant and I've got a good friend, or it's Ben's cousin, I think, that lost quite a few Bitcoin many years ago in a Bali cafe. Um, so, I, and one of the other scandals going to, I haven't quite got it set up correctly, but I could have bought in the Wi-Fi um, module today. I could have mirrored the Fraser's Wi-Fi. I could have spammed their Wi-Fi, so I smashed it, knocks it out, and then regenerates the Wi-Fi with the same name. And anyone here that connects to that Wi-Fi comes through, uh, it's called a man in the middle attack, it comes through my router, and then we capture all your information. So unless you're then dialing through a VPN, um, you know, we have all the information you're doing, you're typing, sending, texting, so. All right, have a go, get wrapped up. All right, the rest of the stuff, a lot of it's very self-explanatory, updates, antivirus, we need backups. So I really want to make this point. If you don't have anything else in your organisation, have a disaster recovery plan and a cybersecurity response plan. So what are you going to do when you've breached and you are encrypted and hackers are going to expose all your information publicly, social media, online, what are you going to do? How are you going to approach that, especially if you're a decent organisation? Cybersecurity insurance, very important. 25% of small business has it. I think 99% needs it. Um, the only problem I see with the insurance companies is that they are paying too much for the, uh, for the ransom. So it's driving prices up and it's encouraging people to come and attack and then and try and negotiate with insurance companies. That's a whole other conversation. You can get personal cybersecurity insurance too, $350 a year, it's very cheap. So if you do pay for that car or that house and you lose your money, um, you'll get it back. I've got the insurance companies willing me out to talk these days, so that's uh, that's that slides there for them. Um, managed services, a lot of the organisations we deal with. Um, it's diff this, this is an old slide, I put that on purpose. Used to be remote support. Was managed services now, your organisation you're dealing with should be talking about compliance. This is where they should be. Uh, they should be having those discussions on, on an ongoing basis. And the uh, the essential aid and truth model that the Australian Cyber Security Centre put out, that's what they want. That's one of the boxes you have to tick that you've got an organisation you're dealing with asking the right questions. I mentioned before how things have changed so much. Um, we can't protect people at home. You want BYOD, your own devices, your own routers, etc. Um, it's changed a lot. So this is why this stuff from, and this is the Australian Cyber Security Centre model. Eight areas, they've got mature level three layers there. So you can zero, one, two or three. And it's pretty simple to follow. And 3365, but here's your compliance manager. Really simple stuff. I mean, it's not simple setting it up. We go through a thousand line items in a spreadsheet to sort of get all your policies and procedures, but then you're given a score. Everyone loves a score. We showed a client the other day, they got 55%, and we're not happy. He said it was only just a pass, which is great, because if we sit there and talk about cyber security, and you know, they're not interested, but we show them a, a, a nice illustration and, and talk about little things like limiting consecutive logging failures. If we turn that on, adds 27 points, adds half a percent to their score. And that all backs into ISO 27001. So it's an ISO accreditation gear that we're aiming for. So that, that's how that all works. Microsoft have been working on this for many, many years with the Australian government, and it's a great system. It's starting to you know, come to fruition. So that one's probably the take a photo of. Um, what can I do? Get away from these ones, Big Pond, Giant Big Pond, whatever those, the IS, what I call ISP-based email. So internet service provider. They gave you those email addresses for free in the 90s when you had dial-up. You know, that was a carrot to come and to, to join that organisation. Don't use them as email addresses, they're not email companies. And like I said, don't build your lives and your businesses around email. Two-factor authentication, hover over links, password managers, keep updating devices, that's very important. Updates are not generally to improve the device. My Tesla gets updates all the time. Um, most of them are security updates, not features. Um, social media, we talked about all this. Um, and separate you a little bit of personal from, from work. You've got to still keep that stuff sort of a little bit separate. That's who we are. Um, thank you guys. Hope I haven't scared you too much. Hope I gave some solutions this morning. And um, thanks again for having me. And um, again, thanks for the support, um, DFK, with the Cole Andrews Foundation, and also um, Brad and Lisa from Chicago. Today, but uh, a bit like you, I'm a bit stunned, so I get lost for words. And I, it's probably best to let you pondering upon what you just witnessed and, and heard. So I can only say thank you very much for all your time. Um, thank you to, to Matt and your team for scraping websites and hacking into bits and pieces. It's been amazing. 
Um, and I think we've probably got one question left in the room. We're going to pinch another couple of minutes. Has anyone got that burning question they'd like to ask, or do you want to take it offline? Matt's happy to hang around for a few minutes um, to have all rush up and, and chat. Just can, we, can we get a okay, discount for the ring? <laughs> <laughs> he's, uh, I'm sure, very happy to take any phone calls or any inquiries. Uh, He's uh, a future client of DFK, he just doesn't know it yet. So, <laughs> uh, but uh, in all serious, thank you very much, Matt. Um, it's been amazing, you've given up your time, and I know you do that quite often with a lot of other businesses, and you're, you're a big fan, all I can say is thank God you're on the side of good, not evil, so I'm pretty sure you can stir up a bit of trouble if you really want you to. We've got a little small gift for you and perhaps the team, um, just to say thank you, so I um, really appreciate that, so thank you very much, enjoy that.